I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. My mother always said to me as a kid, I used to have these nightmares about snakes. And she said, you're going to have a lot of enemies, son. Graham Abbo Henry has seen parts of Sydney many of us only ever read about. Then I did my first armed robbery. I was probably 15 or 16 years of age. I actually did it before I even went to jail. I can always remember I had this extremely big high. As Nettie Smith's right-hand man... You know, him and I had clash all the time. We had a sort of love-hate relationship. He always liked someone that he could control and he realised he could never control me. The notorious underworld enforcer was at the forefront of the city's underbelly during the 80s. When I moved up the coast in about 84, that's where I'm bringing my kids up. You know, I'd be up there for three days and then four days we'd be down there. As far as I was concerned growing up, I was a bookmaker. I had a fucking bad chip on my shoulder. Those events just changed me. Graham Henry, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Thank you very much, Mark. P- pleasure to be here, mate. Your nickname's Abel Henry. Yes. Yeah. You got Aboriginal. Yeah, blood, yeah. You? I didn't find out until I was 65. But You're joking me. No. no. I always thought I was Spanish and that I got that nickname when I was 14. Oh, well, they started to call me Sambo first and I went, what the fucking Sambo shit? What, what do I polish your shoes or something? <laughs> you know what I mean? So I got dirty on it. And uh, so I'd end up Abel. You know, I had the skinny legs, a flat fucking nose and... And uh, very dark skin, and uh, and I was very dark when I was young, and uh, but I never really knew. And then when I was forty nine, I got diabetes, and then and then every time one of my daughters had a child, they used to say to her, "Are you Aboriginal?" And they'd say, "No." I'd say, "Well, you've got a black line that runs from your navel down to your crutch. Only Indigenous people get oh, it." Really? Uh, when you uh, that was a bit of a bit of a hint, but you didn't know. I didn't have a clue. Even though my first daughter from another married, like knocks around with all the abos now, well, works for them, uh, looks a curry the moment she was born, you know, and still does. But how did you find out? Like, so did you go back? Uh, I went, my sister was dying. She had cancer. And I went up to uh, uh, Ballina and I went to the hospital and uh, saw her and, um, and she said, listen, I've got something to tell you. I said, you're going to tell me I was adopted, right? <laughs> And I said, uh, I said, I don't care. And she said, no. She said, Mum's your mum, but the bloke who raised you is not your father. And right. I went, well, why didn't you just fucking tell me that 100 years ago? I said, I don't really give a fuck. You know, that's what I said. You know, I said, I don't really give a fuck. I said, but that explains a lot of stuff. So so do you know what tribe? No, what? I've got no idea. So it's like a lost generation because I don't know any family history. So I went to the Awabical mob up in... Um, Newcastle, and I told them my history, told them everything about it. Uh, I introduced them to my other daughter from my first w- girl who died. She was a diabetic, type 1, went into a coma and never came out of it. And I tried to get custody of the child, but I was about 19 at the time and they wouldn't cop it, you know. And uh, plus I had a violence record, so that was the end of me. I was no hope of ever doing that. But... Um, so anyway, I didn't ever catch up until uh, until I ran into an Aboriginal girl in uh, Tamworth jail who was liaison for adopted kids, and uh, and I knew her as a kid. I grew up in the same area as her, and I said, "Listen, I said, uh, can you have a look in?" I said, "I don't know if she'd be registered with the Abo kid, but her name was Rachel, Rachel Smitzer, or she could be under whatever name." Or I said, "So anyway, she checked and she said, there I found her." So when I got out. I went and met her at uh, Darling Harbour and as soon as he turned up, I said to my wife, I said, she's a lesbian. <laughs> she said, how do you fucking know that? I said, you're 100%. Anyway, she brought her girlfriend with her and uh, she, anyway, she was a professional singer like my older daughter is, except she she had that real curry look about her where my other kids haven't got it. You know, you got a good tan on you. So yeah, I yeah. And I, I always thought you must have known that you were. Yeah, no, nah, didn't have a. I thought it was part so Spanish. You, when was it when you found out? What age, do you reckon? Properly. 65. Serious. Yeah, 65. That's only a few years Just ago. Just after I fought for the Australian title over there. That's only, few, that's only a few years ago. Yeah. yeah. That's not that long ago. That's yeah. mad. Yeah. So well, you just mentioned, um, you know, when you're nine and you had a history of violence or a record of violence. Yeah. Let's just talk about violence for a second. Yeah. A lot of people get pretty confronted with that violence. Yep. Does violence worry? Does it scare you? No. 
No, it worried me as a kid. Or take me back there. You know, watching the violence with my mother and all that scared the hell out of me. Who was committing the violence? Uh, my my original father, yeah. uh, Cess Henry, returned soldier, full of uh, drugs from the war, painkillers, and uh, and mixed with the alcohol, fenobarb they were called, and uh, mixed with them, just sent him into he was a mental case, mate. Tried to kill me when I was uh, 15 with a garden matting through the bed and lucky that I, I had a, something, I won an amateur boxing tournament and I put it up on the door and it fell onto this plate that I won and that used to wake me up. That's how paranoid of him I wow. was. So that, that's one of them things that's probably kept me so aware all my life and saved me ass so many times, you know what I mean, because I was always always aware all, all my life, you know. As a kid growing up during that period, you always sort of, let's call it paranoid, um, but were completely aware of what might happen to you as a result of oh, yeah. so this bloke in the house. Mm. You're, you're, oh, you're, yeah. You're, I, you're, I had a real good awareness, you know, just incredible one. I've had all my life. I mean, you know, to the point of I'll, I sometimes I even know before things happen, you know, I'll have a dream. Like my mother was very psychic. My younger daughter's extremely psychic. Like she can just go past, like yesterday she just passed her, her, uh, all these balloons and she got all this bad shiver over her and she had to pull up and go over because the night before she dreamt about this kid dying and she went over to this uh, pole and there was a sign up on the sign about the, this accident that had been there and she said, why are you trying to contact me? Serious? So she probably already wow. got an answer, I'd say. So, oh, she's unbelievable at it. But I was the same except I could call on things, I could call on spirits. It might take me a week, might take me a fortnight, but I, I've made I've had enemies sit on the end of my bed and tell me things, and then I'll, I'll go. That's not what I wanted. You to mean know. in a dream? No, no, not in a dream. In real I, life. I saw it like there. My God, strike me dead on yeah, the spot. You mean like like a vision sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly a spirit. You know, not a ghost. No, no such yeah. thing as ghosts. They're spirits. You know, yeah. and um, I, but I've always had that. And my mother always said to me as a kid, I used to have these nightmares about snakes. And she used to say, what are you dreaming about? I said, snakes. And she said, well, what happened? And I said, I fell into a big pit and all those snakes were going at me. And she said, you're going to have a lot of enemies, son. <laughs> this is when you were a kid. Yeah. And now she right she was. But, but, but I can honestly say by the time I was 14 or 15, I already knew where I was going. You consciously knew? Consciously knew. I just knew. And I don't know why. It was like I used to say to myself, my life, my life's like a movie. I, um, I know, I kn just knew what I was going to do. And I don't, I don't know really why. I, I, can, I can, can't blame the untouchables, but I used to watch it a lot with my mother. It was the only piece we ever had in the house. Pretty sad, really. It is. Well, it's sort yeah. of sad, but, I mean, you've made the best of it. Like, yeah. I mean, and you're still sitting here. Yeah, that's you know, right. I'm like still a lot of the blokes that you hang out with. On me life. That's right. Yeah, but there's a lot of blokes who you did hang out oh, with. I know. Who, They're all, who aren't all gone. Sydney. That's right. And exactly. Either that or they're locked up. Yeah, that's right. You can become used to violence. Oh, you okay, can. You very, saw it, but you then can, you but did it. Yeah. And now, you can be a little bit addicted to it, you know what I mean? Yeah. And things can get out of hand and you and, and you got to – have that control. I was lucky I had a, lot, a lot of common sense about me, you know, uh, but not on the drink. You know, if I was full of drink, I didn't have any common sense. But uh, I don't think anyone does. But I always knew when to pull myself up, you know, even if I had to put one in someone, which I've done. Um, as in shoot someone. As in shoot someone, you know, over the years, uh, 35 years in organised crime, so... Came around a few times, and uh, but it was always the last resort. You know, after it, I can always remember, especially the first time, I had this extremely big high. You know, like I'd been on cocaine or something. I've never touched it, right? Never touched a drug in my life. So, and I thought to myself, you need to pull yourself back here, buddy, because it's not a it's not a, a proper feeling. No, that's yeah. right. It's not. It's not it's false. It's all false. Okay. I mean, where did that sense of what is right and wrong, so to speak, mm. you know, the weird yeah. words, but where did you get that from? Oh, I just think my conscience, you know. But is that your mum oh, or is I that... think it's my mum, you know. I think it was my mother. I just had this 
conscious separation in there that I could, you know, I could separate the, you know, things I would do and things I wouldn't, especially when I was running with him with my old partner and he'd want to do certain things and I'd just pull up on it and I'd go, no, no way in the world. So the difference, so this is pretty interesting because mm. to me at least is that, um, you know, growing up I've known sort of people like that yeah. and um, the, there are some who just don't give a fuck. Yeah, that's right. And they do. They will fucking do mad shit. Yeah, and, yeah. And they've got no conscience. Yeah, so to that's speak. right. Yeah. And to some extent, they're psychopaths. Yeah, they truly. Oh, hundred percent. I've met a few in my life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, but then there's others who've done this stuff. that might have been on the drink. They might have yeah. been taking some drugs. Or might have been yeah. desperately. But they pull back. They go, yeah. fuck. That wasn't that cool. Yeah. It sounds like you're in that category because just sitting here now. Yeah. You could be just some grandfather. Yeah. Um, you know, with great respect to, to yeah. your age. You could be yeah. some grandfather who's talking quite a lot of common sense. Yeah. You don't come across as a bloke who was a career c- criminal, yeah. you know, hanging out with probably one of the yeah. worst reputation dudes in the country, Ned, yeah. and Ned Smith. Yeah, you know, yeah, and you yeah. were, yeah. you know, there was a group of it, it wasn't just him, but it was yeah, a whole no, group no, of it. That's right. There was a gang. That's right. Yeah, there's a gang. Yeah. And uh, did all sorts of nefarious things, yeah. whatever. Yep. But just sitting here now, you're talking like, to me, like a normal, rational, Family man, yeah. member of society. I said, "Well, I am," and and I and I've always tried to separate that life from that life. Like when I when I moved up the coast in about eighty four, I moved up there and I fell in love with the place, Lake Macquarie, and I just said, "It's where I'm bringing my kids up," and I need to separate. I don't need to be coming home while I'm in Sydney and then going through this, getting calls and going out in the middle of the night and upsetting the. You know, or walking around with wigs on and cannons on me all the time, so um, moaning guns. I, I took them up there and when I did, it was the best thing I did. And and so then I'd, you know, I'd be up there for three days and then four days we'd be down there. As far as I was concerned growing up, I was a bookmaker. You know, I just didn't. Take bets. Yeah, that was it, you know. Sydney in the 80s, 70s yeah. and 80s. Yep. Pretty wild fucking joint. Wild as they come. Wild. Um, <laughs> and... Not only that, even the coppers were wild. Oh. Because that's, you know, how. Well, without them, we didn't survive on a lot of the, you know. And I mean, that's how organised crime operates here. Though it was in their interest, the police, their interest to sort of do deals, so yep. to speak, yep. with powerful groups yep. to make sure things don't get out of hand. That's because exactly they would often right. get you to make sure you and your group, to make that's sure a certain, another group or a individual. Yeah, that's right. Wasn't out of hand. That's right. Exactly right. And it sort of sounds sensible. Yeah. Remember? Well, it was. It kept, it kept the lid on a lot of stuff and uh, that erupted in Sydney, you know, when there was other people trying to vie for control and, you know, well, we just, just pulled them into gear and, you know, and they knew we had the power. But in return for that, you have to get a bit of a green light. Oh, well, the green light was given to Ned, of course. Yeah. And, uh, and, of course, uh, everyone run under that umbrella. Now, when I say about the green light, I, and I often get in arguments with blokes about this because I say, oh, well, you know, you must have been telling and must have been giving information. I said, well, I can tell you, as God as I'm sitting here, you know, that I've never been a narc in my life. And You want to give up? No, 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 never. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, the yeah. police knew that. I mean, they'd throw me out windows when I was a kid, you know. They learned very early, uh, that, yeah, that's not my go. But uh, and they'd never ask me anything, and if they did, I would have s- snotted them, yeah. you know. Um, but Ned, uh, you know, I said to Ned, you know, I questioned it early in the piece in '76. I said, "How come your other mate just got 13 years and you walked away?" He said, "Because I paid them." I said, "Well, why didn't you pay for Bob? You know, Bobby Chapman, his mate." And he said uh, he just wanted to fight it himself, you know. So, I mean, when someone's been your friend. I mean, you take them on face value and, yeah. uh, you know, and then you just let things roll as, and, and try and suss it out yourself. Well, I, you know, as the years went on, I started to see a few little sneaky things, but I can never say that I saw him telling on anybody. I mean, I've heard him talk out of school at lunch, at, while having lunch, you know, and there might have been a detective sitting there and he'll say, or oh, someone say, Dave Keller, uh, selling fucking plenty of drugs and... Uh, so and so, you know, and I'd go, the fuck is saying that for? He said, they're sweet. He said, they're on side. I said, I'll go and fucking put someone onto him. Hmm. You know, I said, snap out of it. Don't fucking go dropping names like that. That's a fucking dog act. You know, so I'd, I'd you know, him and I, I'd clash all the time. 
we had a sort of love-hate relationship and uh, he always liked someone that he could control and he realised after a certain event in Sydney that he could never control me and uh, he sh- actually shit himself and, uh, and left me posted and, not, and I had to go in and do something on my own and uh, when I looked around he was gone. He took off on me and uh, I, I thought to myself that night, now we're talking about 1984, 85, not long, you know, about six or seven years into the relationship, I thought this bloke's got the falsest reputation I've ever heard. And in all the years I ran with him, that was ten years I ran with him, 76 to 86, and I walked away and run my own gang. And then then I run with Stan Smith for 13 years, Stan the man. In some respects, Stan Smith was a bit of a legend. Oh, he was a legend. Right? And and against he was against powders, all powders. Uh, no. He, he's, didn't he? He, he liked, he liked died, the two. He, yeah, but he. No, but in terms oh, of business. Heroin, oh, yeah. His son died. Yeah, yeah. And that was it. Yeah. And then Stan said, don't oh, do something. Yeah. You know, no, he didn't it. like anyone that was involved in that. And he said that to me a few times, you know. I said, so you're going to blame the bloke who, you know, I said, do you know what happened to his son? You know, we got run over. I mean, Stan's dead now, I can mm. talk about it. So the, the bloke got run over, we gave him the gear down at Monavale and he ran over him about ten times and killed him. And um, and I said to him one night, I said, well, tell me something. I said, if I went home and flogged me wife when I was full of piss, right, I said, which I've never done, would I... Would I blame uh, the publican for serving me the beer or would I blame myself? He said, well, you blame yourself. I said, well, it's the same for the supplier, isn't it? I said, you know, he's got a commodity, he wants to unload it. You know what I mean? Your son's the one who's addicted on it. The bloke who was selling it wasn't. You know what I mean? So and how'd he take it? Because well, he wasn't very happy about it. Everyone heard of Ned Smith, yeah. but Stan's... Well, Stan Smith was a complete kettle of fish altogether. He was a um, very intelligent bloke. Uh, most unassuming bloke you'd ever meet, uh, small in stature, tough as nails, could fight uh, as a young man, you know, only fought professional. Uh, only had a few fights, I think about eight or something like that, but uh, we're talking a lot, the stadium days. But um, but he was a real enforcer and when he put him down and when he killed him, most out of, I know, 16, but he, he really did. I say 25, I say 16 that he really did. Uh, two or three of those were with a couple of other people where they sprayed someone up, you know. Um, most of the time it was just on his own and he'd just do it on his own. Sometimes he'd use underwater equipment to get to a certain place, get out, wait in the driveway, wait for him to come home, boom, put it back in, up in the water and end up somewhere else. I mean, he was a pretty smart operator. And everybody sort of... Was not scared of him so much, but with total respect. Like, oh yeah, didn't every, cross him. every I've never ever heard anyone give him a bad rap, you know, ever, you know. I've never even. I think I'm the only bloke who's ever argued with him. <laughs> you know what well, because when you I said mean, to me, we that, used to have some big ones, really, some Barney's, you know, yeah, right, but just over topics, you know. Would say to Stan Smith what your opinion was, yeah, for God's sake, and you would argue with Ned Smith, who yep. was. Different sort of character stand. Ned's yeah. much more irrational yeah. and likely to do anything. Yeah. You don't know what he's likely to do at any yeah. one point of time. Exactly. So, have you always been the sort of guy who would uh, voice his opinion in terms of fairness or what's fair? Oh yeah, I'll I'll uh, just uh, always have always as you know, a kid yeah, right through all, all the way through. You know, if I saw someone two out and someone in the yard at school or whatever, I'd always go over and stick my head into it and intervene and. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, so where'd you get that sense of fairness again? I don't, I don't know. I, I, I think I got it because I hated bullies. I hated, I disliked my father so much uh, through what he did to my mother and I mean he punched her up like a prize fighter. She only had one leg, my mum, and uh, he punched her up like a prize fighter. Drunk? Badly. Was he a drunk? Oh, well, he was on the drugs, He yeah. was on the drugs. He was, you know, the Fenobarb and... Um, you know, those massive painkillers which they barred off the market in 1974, but he was still getting them. Uh, early 80s, they used to have the red coats. Uh, there was a group of blokes who used to go around and protect all these people bookmakers at the 
Mark Madigan. Well, I remember Mark. I remember he, Mark as a, as a young bloke, you know, yeah. when I was about 18. Mark had a group of blokes. Ned was one of them. Right. And he used to go around and protect the SP bookmakers at the right. pubs. Yeah. So SP bookmaker would be at the pub. Uh, some bloke would have a bet, wouldn't pay. Yeah. Or you'd be drunk and put on a stink yeah. and stuff like that. And you'd ring the red coats. And yeah. Two blokes, well, there's a group of them, but there was a bloke called, I won't say his surname, but Kenny. Yeah, I know him. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, Ned. Yeah. And they'd turn up. That's right. And they'd Both big bucks. Giants. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and they used to turn up. Do you remember that period where this is what organised crime is about? It's not It's not criminal, but yeah. being an SP bookmaker was a crime. Yeah. Because you didn't you didn't pay the tax, basically. It was a bullshit crime. But That's right. It's a fiction, right? But yeah, it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. At the time, you would have got in a trouble having an SP bookmaker. And SP booker Mark, Mark had all the SP bookmakers all around the pubs around yep. Sydney yep. and uh, had a look after them. That's right. And now these blokes to turn up a red coat to the pub. You used to oh, sit. No, 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 there was one in Paddo. I, I, so one, one, I remember because you, you you grew up in Paddo. Epping area. Epping was it. Right? I thought yeah. it might have been from Paddo but yeah. I, I remember I was in a pub in Paddo and I was only in my 20s. Yeah. And uh, these guys turned up and there was a bookmaker in the cor- corner yeah. and a uh, bloke who I became good friends with, um, a guy called Gary Stemmore. He was a good mate of mine, Stumbles. Yeah. And uh, and he explained to me how these guys operated, and uh, oh, right, okay. and th- and that's sort of we're talking about organised crime, but it's not really crime. It's just no, like an organised. That's shit. right. Yeah. You've got a somebody has a bet. And with that it, was before have... they so- he sort of got into the into the big league. Ned, you oh, know, yeah, he I mean, went up. He, to, he went up a level. He, yeah, he went up another level after quite that. a few actually yeah. over, over time. Um, but when people talk about organised crime, they make it sound like it's something worse than it is. Yeah. Um, the crime could be something that is fictionally regarded as. We, the government, don't want you to do unless you pay us yeah. a license for your tax. That's right. So SP bookmaking was like it was nothing. Yeah, it was that's just right. taking bets. Yeah, that's right. And the guys made a living out of it. That's right. And they supported the family and they sent the kids to school. This particular guy I'm talking about, who was part of it, was actually an accountant, but um, and, but just did this on weekends and yeah. nights. Yeah, one night a week and on Saturdays to make extra dollars. Yeah, so he sent his kids to school. That's right, exactly. And well, uh, I used to do it myself uh, and, as paying. Yeah, and, so. and and you had to have support. Yeah, in case someone didn't pay you because you're in a pub Bloody full of drunks and blokes and want to you know yeah. back themselves and all this shit. Yeah, so you need someone to come and sort it out. That's right. And in those days, sometimes you had to be sorted out up around the corner, around the back of the lane. That's right. There's nothing really wrong with that, is there? No, no, not at all. I can remember, you know, like. I was only talking to a bloke the other day about it and the uh, first time I ever really met George Freeman. And I was over at Marrickville and there was a lot of gambling places up the road there, you know, and uh, he used to come there and he'd, he'd give a handful of money to a certain bloke and he'd go and lay him off in all the places, whatever bet he wanted to put on, you know. So while he was there, he was talking to him about a, uh, a bloke that owed a lot of money that they haven't been able to find. I hadn't been able to locate this bloke. And uh, anyway, I stuck my head in. And I said, uh, I'll have Arne around. He said, I might be a bit out of your league, son, you know. And I said, well, give me a try. Is and the quid, other bloke it? said, oh, he, he can look after himself, the lad, you know. And uh, and he said, and he'll collect if he can find him. He said, well, I'll give you a chance. He said, well, that was the last place he used to get. So I sniffed around there. I quizzed a few blokes. Anyway, I reckon it took me about two months and in back into the same pub he comes at the back of Concord. Uh, it's called, uh, uh, it's where the old punt is. Where, what do they call that? Mort Lake, is it? Yeah, yeah, Mort Lake. Mort Lake Hotel. He walks into there and he's still betting and he's betting with the SP bloke there and he, he's got a wads on him, right? So I tagged him when he left the place and uh, he didn't live far from the place. So I would notice where he lived. I checked out the place, see who he lived with. He lived on his own. So the following Saturday, I waited up there. He didn't turn up. So I went, oh. so anyway, I waited to come back the next week. There he is. So I went straight down to his house, in through the side, through the bathroom window, and I waited in his bedroom. And what I had was a water pistol. The water pistol was full of petrol, Right. And I said, Neil, pay me tonight this bar. So I had a big Bunsen burner lighter <laughs> and, uh, got right and I, I, I hid there until he came in. He hopped into bed. I let him get into bed in the nude. <laughs> Fucking sight to see. Big lump of a lad he was to. And, uh, but before he did, he opened up the cupboard and put the money 
in under the floorboard, right, in, in the cupboard so in the wardrobe the itself. So I knew where the stash was straight away. So as soon as he went in, he started having a little snore within about five minutes. I just squirted him all over the face, all over his bed sheets, and I woke him. Well, as soon as he woke up, I got the lighter in my hand, standing there with the balaclava on. Well, he just fucking shit himself, you know. Oh, mate, what the fuck, mate, what's going on? The first thing was the smell of the fuel. I said, mate, I'll fucking light you. I want all the fucking money you owe fucking George now. He said, there, there. I said, I don't know where it fucking is, but it better be fucking there or I'm coming back and I'm going to fucking burn you to pieces. So I'd go out there, fucking went right through it. Anyway, there was 20 over. So I took the fucking lot and I uh, went back and uh, I gave it to him. He couldn't fucking believe that I'd found him and collected it. So he gave me a bonus on top of it and I said, well, I already got a bonus, mate. I've got 20. He said, doesn't matter, you take that. He said, unbelievable. He said, good on you. Anyway, he called me once more after that and uh, over a bloke down the dogs and um, uh, to protect the bookmaker. And uh, I went down there and just stood off the bookmaker and made sure he was sweet all night because there was blokes ripping him and I knew who they were, so uh, there was no problem there. So I just had to go up and pull them up. And and that, that after that I just said, listen, mate, I'm running another uh, another crew and uh, doing my own thing, so uh, don't call on me again. Do you think, Graham, that a lot of crime, back in those days at least, was to some extent fueled by the fact that there was a lot of cash around, which is not the case oh, today. Oh, shit, yeah. Oh, big time, big time, you know. But, uh, you know, that, that folding still comes, with it, but they've got to find that way now to, to, deal with get, it. to deal with it and get rid of it. Well, you, know, you might feel look at you weird if you pay cash now. Yeah, like, that's right. I mean, I know. look at people sometimes, they pay cash and they're like, like, well, I, I went to the bank uh, just a couple of weeks ago and just to draw out five grand and they give me the biggest quiz of all time. You know what I mean? Yeah. They said, what are you going to use it for? I said, well, that's none of your fucking business. And I said, you know, it's got nothing to do with you. Well, we just want to make sure you're not getting scammed. I said, no. It's my that's money. That's for the taxation. I yeah. said, well, tell the taxation. Yeah, because they have to fill forms out now. Yeah, that's right. This crime hasn't stopped. It's just different. Do you oh, think yeah. we've gone too far? I mean, the co- coppers don't consort anymore with the criminals. Yeah, no. They're not allowed to. That unless well, uh, unless someone's a gig. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah, right. A yeah, formal gig, you know. A I mean? couple of blokes around with the green light. Yeah, yeah. Sydney, but you know, know what I'm saying. But yeah. basically, yeah. Um, but as but we're, they're getting less arrests. There's more crazy shit going on out yeah. there now than ever before. Yeah. It's and out of control. They've got no balls. So, uh, they don't have the balls like they have in there. Look, anyone was carrying on how things carry on today on the streets. How you know, families are feuding with each other and people are falling all over the place. They would just run straight into your door, kick your fucking door in, blow your head off and put a gun under your pillow. Yeah. You know what I mean? Straight in your hand. That, that's how they operated and and they had the control. And it would work. Yeah, and it worked. It fucking worked. Why it do you think put it the stopped? wind up the normal, the normal crims. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I said, if you didn't have the uh, working in the, in the organised crime world, well, then you're, you're in the mug game because otherwise you were just going to spend your life sitting in and out of that joint, you know what I mean? All of those sort of inquiries really brought it. In the old days they didn't, they just brushed them under the carpet and they were gone. But the last one sort of brought it to a bit of a head and the corruption Then Ned rolled, you know, he rolled on 92 police. I mean, he wouldn't have known 19. Yeah. So as far as I'm concerned, the, the, the ICAC helped him, you know, point out people, you know what I mean? Even uh, if, by the way, you know, even if they weren't a criminal. He was rolling on him. Oh, 100%. He didn't like him. He didn't like him. He you stitched know, him that's up. That's what he was doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he didn't know 92 police. When I read that report, uh, I, I nearly died of fright. I mean, I had to get involved in, in, in all that shit myself and they pulled me down there, but I lasted a minute and a half in the witness box and they, they booted me, you know. I said, there's a bodging up statements here. I said, I made a tape recorder interview. Play the tape. Get out. Got out. That was Ern Temby. That was headlines the next day. Henry ejected. You know, so I was glad, but I spent two and a half years in solitary confinement over it. You know what I mean? That's, when, that's you... when my hair fell out. <laughs> what was the first time you went to jail? Like, uh, 1969. I got three months, I think, for blocking a thoroughfare. What's that mean? That means I was standing in the way of everyone on their way to work on Epping Railway Station. Why? Um, what is it? That's that, was, that was just. What they wanted, to, they just wanted to be smart. I say they had to be guts. 
And, um, you know, and I wasn't adverse to not not belting them on the chin, you know. I was always hitting them on the chin, so. You would have been like 20 or 18, 19. Oh, no, 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 I was younger than that. Yeah, I was just 18. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It was 1969, so well, I think it was my 18th birthday. They arrested me and they knew it. They pulled up me where they charged me with blocking the thoroughfare. I was sitting on a fence, right, a little fence, a little picket fence. We all used to sit along like crows, you know. We're all sharpies, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and uh, next one, I was just waiting for the pub to open. We're going to go down there. I'd already been there for a year, probably drinking, but we we're going down there legally this time. But, um, you know, but next one, they, uh, so they hit me with that vagrancy, something else. Anyway, I got three months jail. Where'd you spend that? Uh, Parramatta months? jail. Parramatta. Yeah. And, uh, um, but I was in with all the old heads, you know, like because all of them were all training centres before that Long Bay Training yeah. Complex, uh, Goulburn Training Centre, Baffers Training in Parramatta Jail. Well, that was the end of the road. That's where you went if you were a real hardhead. So I ended up there and I, I just started working in the uh, tinsmiths, I think it was, and um, started, you know, like when Chow A's and blokes like that were there and and uh, I got on fantastic with them. I didn't have any problems with the blokes trying to fucking get about me or had a few whistle at me a few times when I fucking... Do you think boxing helped you have that confidence? Because you're um, a decent amateur fighter. Like yeah, I just think maybe more the, more the street and I knew I was willing enough to use anything. You know, well, they I, knew you were willing enough to yeah, use anything. Yeah, that's probably that's right, pretty important know. too. Yeah, that's right, exactly. And then right. what happened, out, like, so you get out after three months? Yep. What's your, what, do you remember what your first sort of actual criminal business well, transaction I started, uh, uh, you know, I was running prostitute uh, out the back of a van at the back of the uh, hotel. I used to pick up all the punters and take them for a drive around the block till the egg timer turned to, I think, we, you know, three minutes, six minutes. That's how much they were in the down in the uh, Burke Street here and all yeah, that. Yeah. That's all you'd get, three minutes. You'd have to go like a rattlesnake, you know. Well, you mean up around Liverpool Street, around that territory? Yeah, yeah, yeah all yeah, up yeah, around yeah, there, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I Because these started, were lined up the road there. Yeah, all, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And uh, so we'd just take them around, turned over a couple of times, give them, probably give them six minutes or something, pull up and just say, mate, roll up the roller door. Do you want to go again, mate? The bed was bolted to the thing. Yeah, mate, I'll go again, bang. Off they go around, we go again. Pick up another punter, off we go. Anyway, then next minute I got headlines in the Rival magazine. Oh, Rival. Well, for people in a Rival magazine was oh, a, a black and white newspaper type thing. Which, by the way, the only way you could get it when I was young was you had to pinch it from the news agent. But, That's right. Um, it was Rybal was it was a sort of a pornographic thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but they used to write about all sorts of stuff. That's right. Yeah. So I was headlines in that, and it was uh, uh, I can still remember the headlines. It said "Teenage Vice Ring," and um, it said there's a thug known as Henry. Didn't give me full name. Uh, who runs prostitution and a standover protection racket around the area. And uh, anyway, they're talking to one bloke and he said, and how do you know so much about it? He said, oh, because he broke my son's arm. I own all the chook farms around this area because <laughs> that's all they were around there, ride and all them areas. They had big farms, vegetable farms, chook farms. So, so he said, uh, you know, there's no telling what this young thug will do. That, well, that was, well, that, by the way, if I could just yeah. just step back into that for a second. Yeah. Okay, prostitution was illegal, got yep. it. It's an ethical decision made by governments and maybe society makes a decision, whatever the case may be. Yeah. It still exists. It's always existed yeah, it always and it will continue existed. to exist, okay? Yeah. So That's let's right. take the morality out of it for a yeah. second, okay? Yeah. You were sort of like sort of quite enterprising in, in, in that. Yeah, yeah, right. I always business. used to think ahead of myself. So you, you got know, a like, bed bolted to the back of the van? Yeah, yeah. And I got an egg timer, or I got a timer yep, at least. Yep, there was yep. no mobile phones in those days, so you couldn't do, use a mobile phone timer, but you had an egg That's timer. That's right. And you charged by the by the period, like That's three right. minutes, six minutes, whatever the case That's may right. be. Exactly. And you knew well enough just you knew where it was, was down yep. in Liverpool Street, wherever yep. it is. And in terms of the standover thing, you had to protect the girls. Yeah, I did. So protecting oh, women. Oh, yeah, anyone ever touched them, they were in plenty of trouble. So, you know, and they were willing participants, the girls. They weren't someone this, we'd stood over or anything. No, no, but it's around the other way. The standover was against people giving them hard time. Oh, 100%. Or not paying or whatever or bashing them up or right. being drunk and being an idiot or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And... I mean, people can say, well, you know, this bloke's immoral, whatever the case may be, you know, we're yeah. going to get all the judgments. But yeah. 
But at the same time, uh, you're making decisions based on your standards. Yeah, that's right. And the standards that you saw. And yeah. by the way, it's at a different period. Yeah, So that's you should right. make judgments exactly. about what happened in the 1970s. And there were plenty of people sort of doing it then, then, but like older blokes, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, all the organised crime, all the chapel lanes up here, we used to go up and terrorise all the prostitutes working in the door and get escorted out of there with a gun. You know, stuck in the back of our heads. But that was his all, area. Yeah, that was that was all around here. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, but uh, you know, then I then I did my first armed robbery uh, when I was I actually did it before I even went to jail. I was probably fifteen or sixteen years of age. Did my first armed robbery a bank? then. Was it a bank? Uh, it was something like that. Yeah. And um, and uh, I came away with it. I sort of got off on those things. And I think I got off on them because of John Dillinger. I used to watch John Dillinger. Yeah, the American. And I had a picture of him up on my wall. My mother used to always rip it down, you know, and I'd just stick it back up. Well, most blokes that have pictures of, you know, racing car drivers or Racco Welsh or, you know, and I'd have John Dillinger with a big submachine gun under his arm. And uh, so, you know, I think my life was already mapped out for me really. And, I mean, look, I tried so many things. I tried I could sing, you know. So I went into every talent quest known to mankind. I always got into the grand finals I, and I always got rorted because they were always dud agents in, in that business, you know, and they'd, they'd be set-ups. So I worked up the cross for, uh, up in the old Texas cavern uh, Thursday night for a half-hour spot, doing a few numbers, and then one day I turned up there and the bloke said, uh, oh, you're not on tonight, but he said, but there's a new start for you over at Narrabeen at the spinning wheel. I thought the spinner wheel. Anyway, so I drove over to this place at Narrabone and get there and this pommy bloke said to me, hey, what are you doing there, mate? I said, well, apparently I'm singing there tonight. He said, you got a band? I said, no, I haven't got a band. He said, well, we only have a band there. Well, I knew I'd been bent over. You know what I mean? Someone had G'd me up. So anyway, he wanted to put me on the – he said, "Can you, he said, give us a voice. Give us a hear of your voice without music. I said, well, what's the point? He said, well, I'll get you on new faces. I know someone on Channel 9. So I belted out two songs for him and and I could bang him out, you know. And he said, uh, he said, I'm going to get you on your face. He said, what's your name? I said, Graham Henry. He said, oh, we can't have that for a name. He said, that's a fucking ridiculous fucking stage name. <laughs> so he gave me a name like Dick Carr or something. Like I went, fuck me, Dad, Graham Henry was better, mate. So the uh, next fucking minute he rings up Channel 9, he's got this bloke on there, he books me in there and I just went, fuck. Stick it up your ass. You didn't do it? No. Nah. So then I tried to be a male model. I went into these model agencies all through. They're all down in central, you know, from town all down, yep. down, uh, down the main road there, George Street. So uh, I'd try all these agencies. Yeah, I got a couple of callbacks to come in, see someone. Anyway, never got off the ground, so I just went back to what I knew best. And... Uh, you know, I worked hard, uh, like as a young bloke. I worked, uh, I carted meat, I carted bricks. You know, I was a brickage labourer. I, so you you weren't know, born, I did all that hard yard. Yeah, but, but Graham, I, you weren't, it seems to me that you weren't born as a bad, hardened bastard, like I'm going to be a criminal. Mm. Fuck society. You just tried a whole lot of things. I just had a big chip on my shoulder, right? Do you know? think you had a chip on your shoulder? I had a fucking bad chip on my shoulder. And As a result of your father? Yeah, I yeah. think so, you know. and uh, I feel like you were bad, hard done by, like it's not fair, it wasn't oh, a fantasy. Yeah. Uh, but not only that, I think the biggest thing that gave me what brought out the violence in me uh, the worst was uh, when I went to Albion Street Boy Shoulder and I was 16 and I was raped. Eight days straight. Wow. And... Uh, I've never um, – I talked about it about two years ago. Never talked to anyone about it in my life, not even my wife. She knew something had happened to me. Uh, it still hurts now. I can see it. But the, uh, the thing about it was when I got out and I, got, I ended up getting a bond, I was on remand. And uh, there was a screw and they used to bring in pedophiles into the place because I never knew the other blokes. Didn't know who they were. Didn't know, even know if they even changed blokes. I've got no idea. So 
and I slept in the bowl and they locked me in a cell, right? Everyone else was in a dorm, I was in a cell and he kept calling me a little black bastard. First day I was there, I knew I was in trouble, you know? Stay in the chair, you little black bastard. Everyone else would be chair on, soap on, soap off, step out, next four in. That's how they operated it, right? So you'd do it quick, you'd be under the shower for a minute. You know what I mean? You stay in there, you little black bastard. That was the first day. I never fucking forget it. I thought, oh, I'm in fucking trouble here. Don't know what's wrong with this fucking bloke, you know? And I thought, he probably thinks I'm a fucking, you know, curry or something, you know what I mean? Could say. But then there was other curry kids here. Well, I, I wasn't a bad style of a kid, you know, I had... You know, and I had the, the nice short hair and the, you know, because we were sharpies, we dressed look smart. And, short on the sides, a bit longer back. You know, no, no, we, ours were always short or crew cuts. You know what I mean? Uh, a bit later on your era, they had the bit the longer hair at the back yeah. and, the, you know, and different styles. But oh, we had all the buckles and the high waist. Yeah, yeah, and yeah the, the double, the know, double breasts. Yeah, all that. We used to get them made <laughs> and in. flare down the bottom. In Glebe in, uh, sits, in uh, by City Green. I remember them. Yeah, I, I, by the way, I had them, so yeah, I, and yeah, I'm fucking embarrassed yeah, so to say it. I still wear no socks. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, so after that incident, when I got out. So there's eight days in a row. Eight, yeah, at least a week, a full week. And then there was a big argument outside the cell one night. There was a massive big argument outside the cell, so someone sprung them, someone who was either on the night shift or whatever it was, always was the night. And uh, never stopped, it never happened again. A week or two weeks later, I walk out of the place and I'm fucking filthy, mm. you know. I mean, I'm already a pretty angry kid that um, by the time first thing I wanted to do was fucking get down the brain, your park at Epping where all the homosexuals used to get. And square off. And fucking square off. And I fucking stabbed him. I fucking did everything to him. You know, I've jumped off bird bass onto them, onto their bodies. You know what I mean? I've kicked their guts in. And then one day the penny just sort of dropped because there was a big old I'm no sex. I used to drive around Epping and and everyone knew him as JB. He, he was the gentleman of a bloke, and uh, he just liked. You know, fucking having sex with fucking younger blokes. But I'm not talking 14, 15-year-olds or, you know, a little bit older than that. And he'd get around the pub and try and get them, you know. And I thought to myself one day, why am I fucking giving it to these blokes when he's not a fucking petty, he's not a pedophile, you know. It was the same with that Justice Yeldham down there, like in the, he was having sex with blokes in the toilet blocks that wanted to have sex. I thought, well, you know, he's not getting 10-year-old kids behind a school and fiddling them. Like, uh, you they're know, I think they're very funny with that word pedophile. But you they're know all consenting I mean? is what you're saying. Yeah, 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 you know. But anyway, so I just, I dropped off it, you know, and then, but but those events just changed me. They fucking changed me dramatically. And if I went off, you know, I fucking went off. You know what I mean, and mm. and I uh, and the drink wouldn't help that. Yeah, well, the drink the drink would t- top it off. Yeah, you know what I mean. But I was always strong of mind. I've always been that way. I've been. I've always had a good, strong will in me that I'd block it out. Like it's not until I talked about it a few years ago that I started to recall shit, you know, dreams about it, the smell of his coat, you know, shit like that. And uh, <clears throat> I'd have bad days, you know. But um, they, uh, but I was, all, of, you know, and since then I've blocked it out again. You know, it's blocked out. It's only when I've got to talk to someone in regards to it, a lawyer or a, so someone then, you know, then those things come up again. My family know to stay away, but they would have known the things that have happened because they were, I'm sure they've seen the emails that have come from, um, you know, psychologists and uh, things like that. But I'd say that it really turned me and 
had a massive impact on my life as far as my violence went. I had Russell Manza sit here recently. I don't know if you know well, Russell. I knew Russell uh, yeah. in the prison system. Yeah. And and, uh, and he's he runs a program now, but yeah, he does, his yeah. thing is about say his thing is about saying that a lot of people who become career criminals yeah. have had something along the lines that you're talking yeah. about um, where they've been sexually abused yep. um, in, in an institution yep. and, and that's something that he rails against now. Like oh, yeah, up. 100%. But, yeah. And, and it can equally can even, even continue on in prison for that matter. Yeah. It can continue on later on. And that seems to be like a bit of a common theme around the place. You know, oh, like yeah, it does. Abuse. But so, some well, people all of go, you know, they'll turn to the drugs or, you know, I don't think I really turned to the alcohol because of it. I, I just actually I didn't hardly drink until I was about 20 really um, and then I just started to get into it. But, you know, I was really um, and spirits would seem to affect me like more than anything and I'd get a bit, I mean, I was pretty bad-tempered anyway but, but, I, but, I, but I had a pretty good fuse until, uh, but if I was on that, the shoes was that short instead of that long and, and uh, you know, and I'd just snap, you know, and I'd always go overboard, could not me fuck myself. Where do you see yourself now? You've got out of the whole system, yep. you know, like you've got nothing to do with any of that shit. No, no. Lots of stories to tell. Yep. You've been trying to recreate your that's own right. life. Yeah, yeah, that's um, right. You, you manage to get your kids to you sell your book. That's What's right. the name of the book again? Uh, it's called Last Man Standing. Last you Man can Standing. get it uh, at a treacherous life dot com. A treacherous life dot com. So th- th- you go to the and website. And I sign them myself. So, so you go to the website called a treacherous life dot com yep. and you can get The Last Man Standing. That's, that's right. the name of your that's book. That's correct. You were doing um, tours a little while ago with. Uh, What's his name? Um, Roger you, the Dodger. Roger and someone, what's well, his name I too? I did uh, one with uh, Roger. Uh, no, I never did one with Chopper, but I actually put him on in the club I had at Newcastle and um, that was a funny evening and um, and that's when he was with Rogerson. But, you know, I, I actually had a blue with Roger coming back from Brisbane and I kept in Vernon while he was up in the thing. I said, open up a bit, mate. They're all falling asleep here. I said, tell them some facts. You know, you're not going to get arrested for him. Anyway, on the way back, he, he, that night he said to me in the room, oh, you know, you shouldn't have done you know, I said, mate, they were nodding off in the audience. I was watching them. You know what I mean? And you are there you to were, perform. You were boring them, so, you know. And I said, I had them eaten out of me palm. So so next minute, on the way back, then I, I said something to him. I said, now, when Michael Drury was shot during all that gang stuff, well, I got the – they were going to use me as a scapegoat, right? And it's a pretty long story to sort of get into that, but on the way back on the plane, I brought that up and I said, well, while we're having such a uh, good mood today, I said, why don't I just bring this up to you? We're sitting side by side on the wing coming back from Brisbane. And I said, during all of the um, crap I said with that brewery, you tried to make me the fucking bunny. Oh, yeah, yeah. He said, you're fucking paranoid. I said, no, no, no. I've never been paranoid. Paranoid's fear, mate, right? I'm not paranoid. I, I have this awareness. I've had it all my life and I got out, got through the break, you know. I had Christopher Dale Flannery trying to knock me, Laurie Prendergast and another bloke out of my own gang, right? And they come down through, well, up the cross, was from here, just across here in the pub, I went there to meet a bloke, followed me back out and I said, well, I'm not going out of the cross. If I go out of the cross, I'm never going to find out what's going on. And I was always one to go into the lines then. You know what I mean? So I had a gun here, the Blong, the shot Drury, and I had another gun there. And I put them both between my legs like that. I drove up to the street here to the top, crossed over the bridge, went back down the ramp and they were parked on the side. The detective car went out first. They followed in a panel van. Laurie Prendergast was driving it. I didn't realise that at the time, right? Wasn't until later on in that day it clicked. I go down where the New Zealand hotel is, turned right, went up near the cathedral, round down St James Station, down to David James, in the Market Street, pull up the first set of lights, said just not far behind me, but I can see daylight come out of the back of this old sandman 
panel van. The old Sammy right? here. Yeah. I can see daylight and I can, as I look through, now that part of the city Saturday afternoon is dead. You know what I mean? Here's this detective parked on the other side of the road of Castle Ray with his wheels turned out like that. So the block's going to be on, this panel of going to pull up. So I don't know if they're cops or or what they are. Well, I thought, well, I'm going to beat the charges anyway. If I've got the gun here, I'm, I'll be sweet. You know what, I can get through the break, I'll pay someone. And Anyway, next one he swooped out and I went, fuck that, I mounted the gutter. And I nearly killed one of them blokes in the, you know, them old PMG things, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. sitting around the cage, fucking nearly run him over. I reversed back up the street into Castle Ray. Well, it's one way, the buses are coming this way. Well, they've come out of the back of the van, they're all ballot up. And I went, who the fuck's this? So I just drove the car, turned the car straight and went straight up the one-way street the wrong way, down to the rocks, got down the rocks, bought myself a midi. I sat down there and I thought, what just fucking happened then? Right? So I bought this up with Roger on the way down. But when I get back to the pub, Ned was supposed to come with me and never come. And he said, oh, I've got to meet Roger, mate. He said, can you go up and give this bloke that gun? I said, yeah. Well, the gun was the gun that shot Drury. Right? So it was a setup. So when I got back there, when I walked around the corner in Bullwara Road, he was standing out the front of the pub. He nearly died of fucking fright when he saw me because he thought, I'm not coming back. You know what I mean? These are professional hit men. They're, they're going to fucking get him. And he knew how Will and I was. Like I, I'd go on with it. They started firing. I would have just let go in the street. So as we get to the... I said, I don't know what just happened. I either was going to get kidnapped, but they were coppers or they were crooks, one or the other. I said, but here's the gun back. I'll give it to him in a plastic bag, right? I handed it to him in a singlet, right? I'd already wiped it down, gave it back to him, and I said, and you and I are fucking finished, right? And I walked away. Now, I went around the corner, went down the road, I walked around into Bullwara Road and I sat there for a bit over an hour, about an hour and a half. Up pulled uh, Flannery, Laurie Prendergast. They walked down the street. I pulled the detective. I pulled Roger. They're all having a mag. Gotchas. So that's when I said, well, fuck you. And then I started to hunt Ned and fucking a lot of them and tried to get him at the Three Weeds Hotel. Police saved him. I was laying in the bed ready to, in, in the uh, garden bed opposite the Three Weeds Hotel at Roselle. And uh, I thought they, he could hear me heart beating. I was pumping that hard, you know. But he was going down that night and then the bull wagon pulled up on the corner with detectives in it. And there was a new club that had opened up in Balmain and he said, are you, um, hey, Ned, he was just about up in the driver's side. I knew he'd up in the driver's side. That's why I was laying in the garden, right? I've got the gun against me, so I'm rolled over against the wall like that and uh, to try and smother the shorter because it was a big chrome bastard, right, big 357. So uh, I rolled over and they said, you going down to that club? He said, yeah. He said, we'll follow you down. I went, oh, for fuck's sake. So he got through the break. And then Flannery and Prentigast disappeared after that. Uh, that was in 86, May 86, 9th of May. And then uh, I started running my own crew and, uh, you know, doing what I did best. What did that, Roger that say? That was robberies. What did Roger? But, but Roger uh, said to me on the plane that day, he said, oh, you know, that's just paranoia, you know. I said, I'm not fucking paranoia at all. I said, you and I both know. I said, I went to the meetings, mate. I was sitting at the back of Flannery's house with, Preniga, with uh, can Flannery, Ned, while they were talking about it, and I said, you're going to take a copper out. Are you blokes fucking serious? Like I said, what are you going to get involved in this, Ned? I told you fucking not to get involved. And he said, I'm just fucking listening. That's all I'm the doing. The copper being dreary. Because Ned's go was the, he was always going to be in the background, Ned. Yeah, wasn't Ned, he? Ned had nothing to do with it. You know what I mean? And he was never going to have nothing to do with it. That wasn't his go. We knew it would have been the end of him, you know. Um, and... And as it turned out, it was the end for Flannery and uh, and Prendergast because of what they did. But uh, anyway, he he didn't talk to me much after that, uh, Roger. He was, um, you know, he, but he, he knew that I knew. 
And, uh, you know, I still seen him every now and then. I just, but I, 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 what I did say to him was, I said, listen, all I can say to you was, it was very clever business. It was smart. Yeah, yeah. And you got me in. Snooking him. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And I said, but I got through the break. I yeah. said, so good business plan, but you failed. A good business plan. Yeah. Because for them it's business. Yeah. Because you know? yeah, yeah. it's all oh, protecting 100%. revenue. Protecting money, and territory. I understand why they did it. Even that Mark Stan and Mark Stan was involved mm. with a, the copper. A, 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 another criminal who tried to get me, tried to kill me while I was on works release. Uh, fired about you know twelve shots at me. They missed me. Uh, probably the best fucking bit of excitement I'd had in fucking six years. To tell you the honest truth, well, you know my adrenaline was pumping. You know, even the coppers said it. They said, "Fuck you, and all right, mate." I said, "That's the best fun I've fucking had." Do you feel as though you just like to live a life? Okay, leave me alone. Well, I just want to be left alone. Oh, Graham Henry. I just yeah, want to well, just watch my my let family. Let it go, mate. I'm seventy one. Grandkids grow yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. You know, do you think they got a point to prove though? Is is it people trying? Yeah, to... yeah, it's an ego thing, mate. Yeah, you yeah. know, he missed me that many times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just to be, become an ego thing. So you don't carry grudges? No, I, I don't. Yeah. I, don't, I don't really care about him. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, I don't hate the black for it. Um, you know, and people find that strange. You know, I mean, I'd still put him down tomorrow if he'd come at me. You know, and uh, and he knows it. Um, but um, you know, and I, I fronted. Like the whole team in the America's Cup bar, uh, as soon as I got out of jail, and about uh, t- twenty of them turned up at the Hilton Hotel there. I walked in on my own. They were hiding me on the bar. They were everywhere, right? So I just walked straight in, stood at the table, and they came in and virtually surrounded the table. And I told them straight to their face. I said, "Don't insult me, intelligence. I'm well aware it was you and you, your mate, you know, and uh, you did it for the wrong reason." You know, I mean, for what reason could you possibly want to do it? The only reason you're doing it is to cover up yourself because you you were taken out on a Section 44 from Long Bay during the ICAC investigation and you were given the police information and that's how you got your green light and he's still got it to this day. Does Graham Henry sort of hold on to those stories as as identifying yourself with all those stories or do you park that? And say, but there's another Graham Henry over here. Oh, I fucking hope it is. You're still good now physically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm fit. Are you getting like, around good? Yeah, 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 I'm good. You know, I still do my squats every morning, do my push-ups and, you know. But you're looking uh, pretty good health to me. Like you're not drinking much? No, uh, mate, I, I go down and have a couple of beers. Uh, That's I, it. I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not a massive drinker anymore. I only drink mid, mid-strength. Yeah, yeah. You know, the massive drinking days were in the 80s and. Yeah, they were. You know, when, you know, we'd go out and do a knock off an armoured truck or something and then go and celebrate and have a big lunch and that would go through till 3 o'clock in the morning, you know what I mean? So, so do you think you're richer for having lived in that period? You, you know, oh, yeah, it's certainly part of Australian uh, history oh, totally. for sure. I mean we run away from it but the yeah. bottom line is it, it all that. It did happen. That's right, 100%. And, uh, you know, happened. prostitution, you know, all these things, of drugs, it's all been yeah. made illegal by governments yep. because they're trying to control society. Yeah, that's and right. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's just the process, okay? That's how we work. That's, that's right. That's how governments work. That's why they call governments there to govern us. That's and, right. But they'll do govern us in the way they want us to do it. And then they're always going to get people who are going to say, well, fuck that. Um, there's still people who still want beer or booze or drugs right. or whatever, prostitution. Yeah. So we're going to supply it. That's what I always say, demand and supply. It's not supply yeah. and demand. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't know. You're not trying to force yeah. it onto anybody. No, that's right. They they want to buy it, they can that's buy it, right. and they exactly want to deal right. and they would deal it. If you're not going to give them that or whatever they want, the Coke or the heroin or, the, or whatever it is, today they're right. I think if I was running around in the world today after watching them young kids today on the ice, uh, and experiencing it first hand, seeing them, uh, there's no way in the world anyone in my team would be unloading that. Yeah. And if they did, I'd fucking put one in them. It's pretty hectic. You know what I mean? It's yeah, it's fucking horrible shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Horrible shit. Nasty fucking crap. Well, cause, but if you look at all the laws, we've got all these laws now and all, you know, they sort of pretty yeah. much close down your your gangs and yeah, yeah. what you guys are doing and the yeah, cops yeah. are disassociated with you now so they yeah. don't know what's going on unless they've got a gig or they're That's right. listening. Um but guess what? The drugs are worse. That's right. Much worse. Much worse. Still Much killing worse. each other. And there's more murders going on yeah. and the innocent people are getting hit That's right. as well. I mean the difference I guess in our days was, you know, so, someone went missing, they usually went missing. You know, they didn't get left all over the street or 
get shot to death in their car all the time. You and know most what I mean? times they were part happen of here it. and there, but but most times they were part of what was going on too. That's there was right. no they one were, innocent. They, were, they, were, they weren't innocent bystanders. Yeah, we didn't you know drive past your house and unload into your house. Yeah, I mean your home was your castle. You know that was a no no. You, you'd never do that. You know what I mean? So, and um, and that's a shit go. It's the same with home invasions. You know what I yeah, mean? Totally. You know, it's just a shit go. Um, but uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, that's the way it is today. Do you, it's reflect, changed and, do you reflect on what's going on today and think, "Fuck"? Oh yeah, I right, just go, "Fuck." Give me back the fucking green light. You know what I mean? It's just hectic. It's you know, as I said in my book, I said it's hapless. You know, it's uh, it's erratic. You know, it's just uh, all over the fucking place. It's irrational. Yeah, you can't yeah. really see anything around it. I mean, no. it's just it's, it's like no. a little bit. And most most times people go down is, you know, out of fucking ego, out of fucking, you know, jealousy, fucking, you know, it's the, it's the old way. You know what I mean? Really hadn't changed since my day, I guess, but, you know, a, a lot of the things that, you know, they, they were things that I'd pull up on. Like if my old partner in crime would say, well, Fuck him, he's going to go. Well, I used to ring him up. I mean, I've got blokes, and these blokes are now like part of this other crew that, you know, and they're getting on in their lives, you know, themselves. But the, you know, I used to save their asses. I'd ring them up and say, when you're coming into town today, mate, bring your family. You understand? Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. they, I was already giving them a warning. So, you know, and other blokes I've taken raps for, this bloke especially, this one bloke, one, one bloke, I mentioned him in the book, but I don't mention him by name. I'll give him a nickname. I wasn't going to give him up. You know, I used to visit him in the can. I took raps for him for armed robberies. I've fucking done, um, done fucking plenty of things, you know, and and thought I was a, a pretty good mate of his. And then, but it was an ego thing, you know. He, he thought, saw an opening for a smart lad while Ned was locked up and I was locked up. And uh, I was serving eight years and Ned was doing life. And uh, he saw an opening for a smart lad and fucking uh, went straight to the fucking police. Gov had a bit of territory for himself. Yeah, that's right. You know, but he went to the police and um, became, you know, the top fucking boy because he helped them. I mean, I guess that's sort of what happens in business generally. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, they don't go to the cops, but it's sort of the same sort of deal. Like, and we live our lives. Look, I often, people often say, you know, it's really important to be wealthy and all sorts of stuff. I think the greatest wealth that we can have is the 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 aggregation of experiences we've had in our life. Oh, to yeah. be able to say, yes, I experienced that. Oh, yeah, fuck enough. And, 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 and for me sitting here today listening to your stories, I mean, you're lucky you're a good storyteller. Yeah. But you have led a pretty rich life. Oh, yeah, bloody hell I have. You know, a, a really no rich life. About I that, mean, and you're know. here to tell the stories. Yeah, that's right. You're not sort of some guy who's sort of, sort of hiding away no, you know, behind no, it. No, no way in the world. You feel comfortable going out and talking about yeah, it. Yeah, it doesn't worry me at all, yeah, mate, yeah. you know. Um uh, you know, in, in well, a way, I'm, I'm glad I did experience it. You know, there's look. You know, when I, I try to get into the world of you know the good business and the, I did commodity broken, I did. I've tried everything going. I mean, that was more stressful than fucking fucking doing any crime. Being a crook, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Oh, putting up the bullshit in that game. Yeah, well, well there's a lot of bullshit. Here oh wow, well, you know, you got to and do the uh, you know, you've just got to. You know, and unfortunately from the world I come from, I probably would have knocked a few out at business meetings, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I wouldn't have been able to cop them. Great. Uh, Before I wrap it up, I yeah. just want you to give the, the book a, your book a plug again. Yeah. So just tell me about the website again. It's so, called uh, atreacherouslife.com and the book is called The Last Man Standing. I always sign them yep. anyway. Yep. Uh, and, if you know, if it's a happy birthday dad or... Yeah, yeah. Happy Mother's Day or Father's Day or whatever it is, I, I write that in. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, if if anybody's really interested in more more stories, I mean, more more war stories, going back in a period of Australia's history that yeah. was pretty fucking mental, relatively speaking. Certainly was. Um, I think they should go to that website and uh, and buy that book. And I'm going to go to the website buy the book because it's actually a good book to give as a present. I think. Yeah, I should have brought one in with me. I yeah, well, went I, out I, of the I, house. I wouldn't mind getting one off your sign anyway, yeah, but I'll yeah, buy it off. I'll go, I'll go to the website and I'll just because yeah. I know who I want to give yeah, this no book worries. to. And uh, and it's been a real pleasure, mate. And uh, hopefully yeah, I'll see no, you up in Brisbane you. for the fights. And yeah, um, man, 100%. and uh, take care, and I'll see you soon, bro. Good as gold, mate. Been a pleasure, mate. Pleasure, mate.